is it. I'm getting my mother to deal with this one. It's Mr. York's fourth history project this year. Fourth 1916 project. Talk about obsession. Dorky Yorky should be tried for crimes against students. No. <laughs> Offences against the State Act. It's the likes of him that turns everyone off our glorious history. Well, I'm telling you one thing. I am certainly not spending a whole afternoon with my grandmother. Okay, that. that makes two of us. No way. Besides, none of them actually lived through the rising, so what's even the point? Jesus. Um, well, this is all your fault anyways, Keen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Keen. If you go do the primary store stuff, it's your connections that kicked off this blasted project anyway. Oh yeah, blame Keen. Why don't you blame me for the whole bloody rising while you're at? Well, good one, Keen. Oh, shut up, bloody Chris. rising. Well, God. you are the product of the famous Bolton and McBride. Sure, my family won't talk to me about my great granduncle's activities in 1916. All I know is that Eamon Bolton survived the 1916 Rising, and one of my great grannies married Major Don, John McBride. He was son of Maud Gond, who was married to Major Sean McBride. He was executed in the 1916 Rising, and was also mentioned in Yeats' Easter 1916 poem. Yeats hated him, because he himself wanted to marry Maud Gond. I found all that out by studying it in school, not through my parents. Well... Yeats was the one who called the Rising the casual comedy. That speaks for itself if you ask me. Yeah, but in his next breath he said all changed, changed utterly. I know, I know, a terrible, terrible beauty, beauty is born. The 1916 Rising shouldn't even have happened. A shameful blemish on the achievements of Parnell and Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party. What? Are you out of your tree, Chris Fitzgerald? Irish freedom is thanks to the rebels of 1916. Irish freedom? Irish, okay, I'm sorry. What a load of rubbish. John Redmond and his parliamentary party had already achieved Irish freedom by getting home rule for Ireland. See. God. You're forgetting one small but very important fact to Rena, my dear sister. The Government of Ireland Bill wasn't actually enacted because of the outbreak of World War I in 1914. There was no guarantee that Ireland was ever going to get home rule. <laughs> yeah. Debate, 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 debate. 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 Great idea. Who's for 1916 Rising? I'm definitely against it. So am I. Uh, Keen, with all your connections, I don't think you should be in the debate. Mm. Grand. I'm not bothered with it anyways. I could, I, I could argue either side. Oh, sure. Okay. okay, then you can be timekeeper and I'll, <laughs> and I'll be chairman. Same as usual. So I'll, I'll ring the bell at 45 seconds and you'll have 15 seconds to conclude. Okay, um, crossfire to follow the debate and we can take part, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Proposing the motion that the 1916 Rising was not necessary for the path to Irish freedom is Monica Malone and Rena Wright. Opposing the motion is Chris Fitzgerald and Tina Wright. Wait, sorry, wait, no. The twins on opposite sides. Oh, this is going to be fun. Proposing the motion that the 1916 Rising was not necessary for the path to Irish freedom, the first speaker is, Monica, is Chris Fitzgerald. In proposing the motion that the 1916 Rising was not necessary in the path to Irish freedom, I give you the definition of home rule. That is exactly how it sounds. That is Ireland ruling Ireland from Ireland. John Redmond, Irish Parliamentary Party representative of New Ross, had seen the bill come before the House of Commons and fail on two separate occasions, in 1886 and 1892. It wasn't until its third attempt that the bill was finally enacted. You might rightly argue that this was because the Irish Parliamentary Party held the balance of power in London at the time, but he cleverly utilised this to push the Liberal government of Herbert Asquith on the topic of Home Rule. 
His entire career was spent working towards this momentous occasion. It could not be enacted before the summer of 1914, but it was on the statute books and certain to become a reality after World War I. Ireland would be a 32 county sovereign state today, but the 1916 rising just destroyed that possibility. One minute's up. First speaker on the opposing team is Monica Malone. I oppose the motion that the 1916 rising was not necessary in the path to Irish freedom. Chris gave an excellent explanation of what home rule should mean, but sadly did not. The Home Rule Bill or Government of Ireland Act 1914 stated that an Irish Parliament would be set up in Dublin to deal with most, but critically not all, of national affairs. 42 MPs will be seated in London and in Dublin Castle administration will <coughs> be abolished. Our British lieutenants be retained with certain powers over the Irish. Now I ask you, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, how can anyone call this Irish freedom? Yes, at best it was limited freedom. The British had certain powers. The only way to break the stranglehold was by revolution. <coughs> 8th 1916 was that revolution. It generates a new spirit of national belief forever and a soul to seize with true Irish freedom which followed. Thank you, Monica. The second member <coughs> for the proposing team, Rena Ryan, will now address you. I support the motion that the 1916 Rising was not necessary. I thoroughly reject Monica's argument that Home Rule did not mean freedom for the Irish through themselves. Like Chris, I further support the motion that the 1916 Rising was not necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that getting a foothold in the situation is half the battle. John Redmond and his parliamentary party had more than a foothold on Irish freedom. They negotiated by peaceful means. And this resulted in an act, the Government Act, to be precise. And yes, that did mean all 32 counties of Ireland Act. A truly united Ireland ruled by the Irish had been achieved. But no, those fools of 1916 not wait a few short years to see this triumph come to fruition. Their rabble-rousing rhetoric, their martyrdom syndrome, and their total and utter disregard for the ordinary citizens they were meant to represent. Your one minute's up, Rena. Over 250 civilians were killed, including 40 schoolchildren. And to what? To immortalise themselves and so the seeds of the trouble which still fester in this country of partition today. The 1916 Rising created partition. Rena! Due to the 1916 Rising, our small country is now a country of partition. Rena, sit Rina. down! The second speaker for the proposing team, Tina Ryan, will now address you. In opposing the motion, I would like to draw your attention to the last speaker's rabble-rousing rhetoric. There was no martyrdom syndrome and certainly no disregard for the lives of ordinary civilians. In actual fact, Podrick Pierce surrendered to prevent the further loss of life of Irish citizens. Incidentally, Rena, Ulster was really created by Elizabeth I and James I plantation of the region. To understand why the 1916 rising took place, we must look at it in its correct historical context. The Irish people have been impressed by the English since the plantations of the 15 and 1600s, the penal laws, land laws, and the unforgivable neglect of the Irish people during the Great Famine, each one suppressing more and more of the rights of the, this proud Celtic race. The descendants of the planted people who have threatened. Whether or not the rights took place, Ireland was headed for civil war. Edward Carson and the Ulster Unionists had three years to prepare before the enactment of Home Rule, and they used it. Almost half a million citizens joined the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, to oppose Home Rule. Owen McNeill, in response, created and led the Irish Volunteers, a group of over 170,000 Irish men to fight for Home Rule. Yeah, Ladies that. and gentlemen, can you just sit there and tell me the two trained and armed groups in direct opposition to each other would not use military force to achieve their goal? Of course they would. The situation was a time bomb waiting to happen. The 1916 Rising was the best possible course of action. The leaders were visionaries. 
I say to each of you sitting here today that your freedom is tied to their T suffering. Tina, Tina, please oh. hold this A gang of airheaded poets and misled cripples set to be remembered for a blood sacrifice. Pierced though you wore his officer's sword, could not slice a loaf of bread. Oh yes, a terrible beauty is born. That was a comment, not a question. Crossfires are meant to be about questions. Well, I don't care what any of you say. I think they are brave men who ask what they could do for their country. How many of you would make the same sacrifice? Well, all people ask nowadays is what the country can do for them. I'll tell you what they did for their country. They shut down the country's capital for a week. They were responsible for nearly 500 deaths. And they're responsible for the cause of unrest in the country. <laughs> Sorry, Monica, but brave is certainly not the first word that springs to my mind when I think of the insurgents of 1916. And, might I add, they split the volunteers. Um, you didn't answer Monica's question, Rena. It's easy for us to sit here in an Ireland free from oppression and pass judgment on men we knew very little about, except they had a vision of self-determination and they were willing to die for it. Oh, and Rena, they did not split the volunteers. John Redmond split the volunteers. Your precious John Redmond split the volunteers in World War I when he asked them to join the British Army. 15,000 of the 35,000 Irish men who pledged allegiance to the British monarch were volunteers. While I believe the rising was both ill-judged and ill-planned, it was justified. Should my great-grand-uncle Eamon Bullfin, my great-grandfather, John McBride, be proud of me now. From the Wolf Tones of 1798, and the Robert Emmett of 1803, and the James Finton Lawlers of 1848, and the Podge Pierce of 1916, we'd still be ruled by England and just servants to overlords. Following your argument to its logical conclusion, Charlie, you're left with one big question. And let it never be said that Keen White cannot see both sides of any argument. What do you do with the men and women, women living throughout Ireland and Northern Ireland, yes, all 32 counties, who are quite happy to be part of the United Kingdom? Those whose ancestors opposed home rule, those you go to them and say, we as Irish claim our land back after almost 700 years. And you can go back to Scotland or England or hell or Connacht or wherever you like. Oh, but not to Connacht because that's where, that's Irish land as well. I cannot believe you'd have said that. What's about the Vikings that came here in the 9th century or the Normans in the 12th? They were invaders who settled here. Oh, and incidentally, your surname is of Norman origin, Chris Fitzgerald. So, by your own argument, you should go back to Normandy or wherever. <laughs> yeah, she does kind of have a point, Chris. Scottish and English families who lived here over 400 years ago right consider Ireland their home. Bet you don't know who owned the land where your house was built on 400 years ago. Insensitive. We all know that you had to go live with your grandparents after your house was repossessed a few years ago. Idiot. Yeah, sorry Chris, I didn't mean to offend you. I just like to see both sides of any argument. So, a hundred years later, to 2016, and we have the Irish dispossessing the Irish, and we call that progress. The Irish don't even own all of Ireland, sure. Who repossessed our house? The banks. Who owns the banks? Private entrepreneurs, foreign investment companies, multinationals. The same can be said about Irish land and Irish industry. Sure, if you think about it, we don't even govern ourselves. We're run by the Brussels from the EU. Oh yeah, lads, we still have overlords. They just have different names. So, from the Vikings up to the Normans, right up to the English, We've always had our oppressors. The 1916 Rising set out to free us, and we did achieve that in 1923. But in 1973, Ireland joined the EU, and we voted away our freedom referendum after referendum. What are we like? Mm -hmm. No idea. Well, none of that changes the fact that we have a project to do 
from Mr. York. Still he doesn't oh, want oh, our God. take on things. Okay. <coughs> Maybe the grandparents will surprise us with a clear and uncomplicated version of events. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I hardly think we're about to rewrite history here, Rena, but True. you never know. My grandparents were born shortly after 1916. They were close to the action, and it seems that's the only information that Mr. York wants to hear. Well, look at my lips. I am not doing it. Here, I'm out. Um, Monica, are you not waiting for Paddy to open the juice bar? Duh, it's Friday. Oh, juice bar closes at one. Wait. Who's up for McDonald's? Yeah. Attention! Major Bulfin McBride leads the rebel forces on their final assault to the Big Mac. <laughs> I will kill the French guys. And I will batter some cod. I'm going to murder some chicken nuggets. Well, you know, I could demolish a strawberry milkshake. I could pulverize Mac Flurry. Well, I could destroy a chocolate sundae. The rebellion doesn't start until Shut Monday. Up, yeah. Well, I could grab a giraffe. Well, that's a wrap then. <laughs>